This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. takes on special meaning when the person whose life is at stake is someone we know and love. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of bravery and determination in the face of extraordinary odds on Rescue 911. We begin on the morning of August 17th, 1991, as two friends set out together on an adventure in the desert just outside Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> Ultralight is uh, probably as close to flying like a bird as you can get. It is true seat of the pants flying, like slow motion. It is a totally overwhelming feeling. Dale Simpson had been flying ultralight aircraft for more than a year. His best friend, Ray Elam, was new to the sport and had flown solo for the first time the day before when he completed his training. Basically, you're looking down at your feet, and then below that is, is the world. That day, Ray was flying an ultralight he had just bought. After testing it in the desert, they took off across Lake Mead. It's beautiful to fly over Lake Mead, especially along the coastline. Unfortunately, the terrain's a little hostile. Because of all the caverns and low and high pressure, it is very difficult to predict the wind and weather patterns out there. aircraft he purchased flew a little bit faster and was probably a little more difficult to fly than what he trained in. I did give him advice not to fly that airplane that day. I offered my airplane, which was of the forgiving type, but there wasn't anybody going to keep him out of that airplane. plane through and radioed back to him hey it's getting a little rough in here let's get out being a low time pilot i didn't want him in any rough air at this time because the communication was so crystal clear and we were so close. Uh, I had probably already put him in a bad situation by being where I was, in the position over the lake. You always think about the worst, I guess. You could see the silhouette or the outline of his aircraft and then you could see the mountain. Well, at first you lose your depth of field when you see that. So at first I thought, okay, he's all right, he's flying. And then there's that split second where you know it. It's just a heart sick feeling. It just, it, it can't be real. This cannot have happened. When we continue, 
as far away as we are from Las Vegas and from a trauma center, I didn't think that there was any possibility we'd get the patient there alive. When Ray Elam's ultralight plane crashed on the rocky shores of Lake Mead, he was trapped in the wreckage where no one could get to him. As his best friend tried to find a place to land his own aircraft safely, some boaters on the lake spotted what was left of the plane and went to get help. Robert Wolf and Al Jensen were at a nearby marina when word of the crash reached them. I dialed 911, and then that's when I said, Al, I've got the medical kit, let's go. I started going slow, and I looked at Al, and I said, hey, should we really go or what? And uh, he just said, hit it. 501-512, Beach Rescue. The National Park Service radioed for anyone in the area who could help. bad when we first saw it. We weren't sure if he even lived at first. The way he hit that cliff, though, I don't know how fast he was going, but... You want to get out and get up on the cliff? I'll throw you some ropes. You guys want to catch some ropes? We're going to throw some ropes up and tie this thing down. Okay. Looks like it might be slipping. You okay in there? Okay. Any wave okay. from the water that would hit that wing, you could see the plane move. My first reaction was, okay, if the plane's falling in the water, let's stop it, you know? I need some help. We found out then, okay, he was alive. Guys, got the line. Throw the sledgehammer. Grab it out. We were just trying to secure the plane without moving him. Hold on, buddy. We're coming. I need some help. Rope. There was a ridge and a jeep road across the channel down there. It was a rough ride. You keep saying to yourself, he's going to walk out of there. Uh, he probably didn't hit the cliff that hard. He probably landed on top of the cliff and tumbled down, he's gonna be all right. Uh, better judgment, of course, is telling you something different. Oh, it's slipping more, hold on to it. I don't know what that plane weighed, but it had to weigh quite a sum. So I didn't know how long the, the ropes would last. Here, throw it over. And then once we got the plane secure, it kind of got worse. He was complaining about gas, and no one had climbed underneath the plane yet to where he was. I have gas in my eyes. You get gas all over. There's gas every place. Pretty bad. The gas was coming down the side of the mountain and uh, running out on the water. So just that ignition of a boat. Take get those boats out of here. There's gas all over here. Shut off your engine. Run down. There's gas all over the place. There's gas in there was no question he was hurt bad. There's a bar that's going down in his leg. He's got another puncture wound underneath him that's severe and bleeding heavily. And uh, we were flying without helmets. We were supposed to fly with him. State game warden Frank Shaves put out the call for an air ambulance. It's in a remote part of the state of Nevada. Hospitals are a ways away. Everybody out here works together, just not because we want to, but it's out of necessity. Watch that red handle. What's that red handle do? That's the rocket. Oh, no. Ultralight aircraft have a ballistic recovery chute. If a rocket deployed. That'll blow us right off this cliff. Oh, okay. Great. Hold tight, buddy. Hold tight. Help's on the way. Grab the mask, Chris. EMT Renee Jones was part of the medical crew that had to be ferried across the lake by park volunteers. Our first thought when we saw the aircraft was that it was going to be one of those scenes where we work our hearts out and as far away as we are from Las Vegas and from a trauma center, I didn't think that there was any possibility we'd get the patient there alive. He was in an incredible position. If he'd have gone into full arrest in that aircraft, he'd be gone. I mean. There'd be no way you can't do CPR. We couldn't even uh, d really well manage an airway. Leon, get the dispatch and see if we can get Boulder City Hospital emergency room on the air. I want to talk to him. Okay. Make sure okay. your life is in route. Can't get to you, buddy, but I'm right behind you. He's done things for me in the middle of the night okay. when I've been in trouble. Uh, you know, dropped what he was doing okay. and he was there. Okay. You can't imagine the guilt, the, uh, it's, uh, 
That's tough to talk about. The Flight for Life helicopter arrived with a crew, including flight nurse Keith Frederick. We realized that the golden hour was ticking and that there wasn't much time left. Got it? I'll give you a hand when you get it. Yeah, where's that hacksaw? We got a hacksaw yet? He had probably sustained uh, neck and back injuries. And uh, from just the mechanism alone, we were concerned about other injuries that he could have possibly sustained, which would have been internal in nature. All right, what do you guys got? There he is right here. Got a hacksaw. Impaled object there. Okay, I'm all right. Now. Oh, fine. I'm going to cut it right about Does here. Does he vitals on him at all? Pull that back. No vitals. He's up and upside right, let's down. let's go ahead and... It was, uh, very tense throughout it because you didn't know what was going to happen. You hear me? My concern was still, you know, if those ropes break, you know, how many people are going to go down with him? Okay, he's going to go now. He's going to go when I break it loose. Okay. Ready? Okay. Okay. Backboard, yeah, drive by. Yeah. He was maintaining a fairly good level of consciousness while he was hanging upside down. But as soon as he was spinally immobilized on a board, he started to lose consciousness very rapidly, and it was real nip and tuck. The pole that went in him was hollow, inch and a half hollow. When it went in him, uh, which it was about three and a half, four inches, it took all the meat back out with it. Keith, your IVs are on the chest. By the time Ray reached the hospital, his vital signs had begun to stabilize. He was admitted with fractures of the spine, pelvis, and hip, and underwent three operations by orthopedic surgeon John Thalgott. He was treated uh, marvelously well in the field. Yeah, it's a miracle that he wasn't totally paralyzed from this and uh, didn't die in the water. He was in an awful position right from the get-go and it seemed as though all the elements were going to be against us that day. So I was not only surprised, I was damn glad that he made it, I'll tell you. Now you're a bionic man with all this metal, but playing sports and you heard back that? to work again. You heard about that? <laughs> as soon as I heard Dale, he yelled to me, buddy, you're gonna be okay, buddy, you're gonna be okay, I'm here, I'm here. And that meant a lot to me. I think about that, that, you know, that. He was there when I needed him. Ray is a fighter. We're both very competitive. And I think that competitive drive is uh, what's helping him come back. The whole time through the hospital, he wouldn't let me give up at any time. And I can't wait because I'm going to get in better shape than I was before, and then I'm going to take him on the tennis court, and I'm going to... I'm going to abuse him severely. <laughs> Throughout my life, I've always done for myself. Never needed anybody, never needed any help. Naturally, I was wrong in a big way. Here, I was facing uh, which could have been death in many ways over. And people came from everywhere to do what they could to help me. The only thing I ever saw at the whole time was the back of his head. I could walk up behind him, turn his head around and say, I know you, <laughs> but that's it. That's the only way I've seen him so far. Hello there. Man, I waited a long time to see you. I waited a long time to see you. Good to see you walking. Wait, 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 wait a minute. I gotta check something here. Turn your head. <laughs> yeah, that's you. That's you. Definitely. How you doing, bud? I finally reached a point where I kind of got up a little bit more nerve after I knew he was doing well to uh, follow up on his care and talk to him and see how he was doing. Holding on still onto the ultralight and you were afraid. I mean, at Would that point, like we, were well, we, were <laughs> we were trying. It's not often we get to see our patients later. He's a lot of fun to be around and I think he's doing really well. My engine just died and me being a new pilot, I had my hands full and uh, then some can't be happy with that. It is a very safe sport, but I'm through flying. I had a very eerie feeling uh, the first time up alone. To me, that's an omen. This is something that I don't need to be doing. And for once, uh, I'm gonna let Dale win.